rather than focusing on what I do in the lab, I'll try to share with you the thoughts that I gathered by being the Dean of Science for three years, which covers all of the different fields of scientific research. And I believe scientific research in one way or another has been in the heart of human mind and thinking for many thousands of years, but it became much more powerful recently. And it does so in a different shape. And that different shape I called mega trends. So there are new directions in research, and when those take with them people from different continents, different disciplines, different expertise, they become a trend. And those shape not only science, but they are interrelated with societies. And I'd like to give you a, a list of some examples of that. So the very first one is, of course, information. We are all swamped with increasing huge amounts of information all the time. And if you wish, our major goal in life is to define those priorities that will enable us to correctly decide which information to spend time on and which is just rubbish and should be thrown away. In another way, you could say that when science became a prominent force in human societies, people saw that, to some extent, as an antagonism to religion. Religion talked about what you are leaving behind you, what will remain after you, after life. Science was now and then. But information technologies now enable us to leave a lot of what we think and do and write that would remain after us. So in essence, that is a merge between science and the other shapes that were driving society. If we go to the other end, we're talking today about nanoscience. We are making things smaller and smaller, and we are learning that size does matter. The smaller it is, the, the properties of that material will be different. New drugs will have to go through a whole lot of reapproval because when they are nano size, the properties of that medication are, are modified. And of course, this will shape medicine and will lean a lot on information. If we go to the obvious opposite, the mega projects in physics where if you look for the article, the first page will be totally devoted to the names of researchers because they come from different continents, different institutions. They all work together, for example, to find out, as we were hearing this week, that there are many more planets than we ever thought. And, and that is enabled by a joint force of people who use information technologies and their own professional expertise to create what we call a global research effort, which is certainly a mega one. At the same time, they are studying the fundamental forces of nature. What is the origin for those hurricanes that we keep hearing about, for uh, earthquakes? You know, I was, I was teaching across the road here in the Givatram campus a couple of years ago when there was suddenly a huge boom that the whole, the teaching hall rattled. Being here in Jerusalem, I immediately feared that something was happening in the government buildings. But I had a class to take, to, to keep, and, and the student said, what is this? And I said, what, this must be an earthquake. Immediately one of them phoned and said, you're right, my mother felt it in Haifa too. <laughs> and then I became serious and I said, students, there are rules in this university. If there's an earthquake, we all evacuate the room. We need to go out right now. But I just invented them to keep them calm in the class. <laughs> but here you see a very small example of how information technologies change the way we relate to experiences. Of course, the field that I'm involved in and will make a very big difference is medical science, human health, and well-being. 
Now, I won't dwell much about it because uh, there are other speakers in this panel who will focus on that subject. Suffice it to say that from uh, the era of medicine that would say take two aspirins and go to bed, we are moving to a tailored medicine so that every one of us will be treated based on our genetic repertoire with hopefully much better prospects. But the field that is the last uh, uh, frontier is, of course, cognitive, cognitive science and the enhancement of intellectual and physical ability based on our brain power. So this is the era of brain science. And we are very fortunate in our university in having a lot of neuroscientists and superb PhD students who are attracted to this field. And what we see in that field is an example of a trend because they come from different disciplines. People would move to brain science after doing a degree in engineering. They will know how to control navigation features of the brain. People come to brain science from humanities. They are thinking to connect philosophy and brain science. People come from medicine, and of course what they think about is how can we help someone who doesn't have a control over their limbs to do it by brain science. For that you need to combine robotics and nanotechnology and uh, know-how in physics, and indeed our very best students today go for joint disciplines of studies, which we start from uh, the early bachelor degree stage. So brain-machine interface will be a very uh, prominent direction of research. All that changes also the way society relates to science and the way science should relate to society. In the past, scientists would sit in their offices and as we just heard from Professor Pearl, they would go to a meeting or write something and talk to their students. When I worked in New York, someone asked my eldest son, who was then eight years old, what does your mother do? And he said, oh, she drinks coffee with her friends and chats. <laughs> and I was very pleased, you know, I was working so hard. In, if that's the message that he got, I, I was really thankful. But today, we have another obligation. We need to make our science, the meaning of it, the drive in it, the promise in it, the beauty in it, transferable to the uh, audience, to the lay uh, audience. And that is a different goal that scientists didn't really spend much time on until quite recently. And I think we need to add it as one of our most important goals. So I was, I was called upon last week when uh, Professor Blackburn was winning the Nobel Prize for defining the properties of the very ends of chromosomes, which is not really what the daily newspapers in Israel write about all the time. And they asked me, so what does that mean? And I said, look at your shoelaces. You need to protect the ends or else everything will come apart. In the evening, I got a telephone call from another newspaper journalist saying, I heard you on the radio, this is it, that's what we were missing. <coughs> and, and this is one additional goal that I would like to add to the list of jobs that we scientists have. Thank you.